Welcome everyone. My name is Annabel Gonzalez, uh, Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization. And thank you for joining us today for the presentation of this year's uh, World Trade Report, the WTO's flagship publication. And I'm delighted to moderate uh, today's event. This year's edition of the World Trade Report could not be more topical. That report looks at the many ways that international trade and climate change interact with one another and how trade and trade cooperation can offer solutions to the climate crisis. The report comes at a time when climate negotiators and stakeholders from around the world are gathered in Egypt at COP27 to mobilize action to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Indeed, the report that we are presenting today was launched by our Director General, Dr. Ngozi okonjo iwala at a high-level event in Sharm el-Sheikh last week. I understand that the report was very well received, as we will hear from DDG Pogam shortly. The World Trade Report is a huge effort, team effort, and this one was no exception. I would like to congratulate the many colleagues from the Economic Research and Statistics Division, the Trade and Environment Division, and many other parts of the house who contributed to the report. I want to give a special thanks to the report's two coordinators, Jose Antonio Monteiro uh, and Ankai Shu joining us online. In a moment, Jose Antonio and Ankai will be presenting the report's findings in detail. They will be joined by Reiner Lance from the Trade and Environment D Division. Before I give them the floor, let me highlight uh, top three takeaways from the report. The first comes in the form of a stark warning. Climate change risks uh, making the path to trade-led growth and prosperity narrower and more perilous. And that should worry all countries, especially those who remain in the margins of the global economy and have yet to reap the benefits of trade. The report makes clear that the cost and disruptions on trade and global value chains inflicted by higher temperatures, rising sea levels, and more frequent weather extreme events are high and rising. This year, the worst drought in 500 years in Europe, a 23-year mega drought in the Western United States unseen in a thousand years, and the worst on record in China has lowered the water levels of major waterways choking transport and putting an additional strain on supply chains. Not to mention that the threat of acute food insecurity that we are seeing in too many parts of the world has a lot to do with extreme weather events whose negative effect on global food markets has been compounded by the war in Ukraine. So unless we act decisively, trade may no longer offer the clear path to prosperity that it has offered in the past. And this would put many countries at a big disadvantage, especially least developed countries, small island developing states, and landlocked developing countries, which are all those who have contributed least to the climate crisis. I was particularly struck by the work cited in the report that found that a one degree Celsius rise in temperature is associated with a decrease of up to 5.7% in the export growth of agricultural products and light manufacturing from low income economies. For me, that raises fundamental questions about the future of trade and global solidarity. My second takeaway comes in the form of encouraging news. The report is clear that climate change is a collective challenge that can only be solved with huge investments widespread access to technology and rapid innovation. And that's true whether we are seeking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, as required by the Paris Agreement, or to adapt to a hotter world. Nobody should be under any illusions about the scale and urgency of the challenge. For example, to get on track for net zero emissions, investment in clean energies would have to be above $4 trillion by 2030, compared with 1.3 trillion today, according to the International Energy Agency. The encouraging news come out of the report um, is that while the challenges are so huge, so are the opportunities. 
we have a powerful tool at our disposal that can serve as a force multiplier to accelerate the investment, scale up the technological solutions, and incentivize the innovation needed to drive progress towards a just and low carbon future and decent green jobs. And the tool is called international trade. And as the report shows, trade is already playing an important role. Trade in globally integrated markets have been a key part of the renewable energy success story of the past decades. That story is one of dramatic falls in the price of key technologies, as much as 90% for solar power and 70% for onshore wind, along with rapid growth in renewable energy capacity. Simply put, Open world trade is a way to make, make each dollar spent on climate mitigation and adaptation technologies go further. And that is particularly important at a time of rising interest rates and high debt levels. But the report also makes clear that countries can do much more to improve their trade policies and align them more closely with their commitments under the Paris Agreement. Cutting tariffs and reducing non-tariff barriers on environmental goods, services, and technologies is a low-hanging fruit, fruit which could deliver a triple win for climate, for trade, and for jobs. We must also rethink trade policies to make it easier and less costly for businesses to decarbonize their supply chains and shift to clean and circular business models. That's particularly important because as noted in the report, more trade also means more production, transport, and consumption, all of which can result in more emissions and waste if we do not have an ambitious and well-designed climate policies in place. And we must take a hard look at how to harness the role of trade in managing food insecurity in a hotter world. Ensuring that trade can flow more freely and predictably across borders to help bring food from areas of surplus to areas of shortage is critically important for successful climate adaptation. My third and final takeaway comes in the form of a clarion call for collective and coordinated action. I recognize that our ability to cooperate across countries is being hampered by growing trade tensions and widening geopolitical drifts, which threaten to pull us apart at a time when multiple and reinforcing crises demand that we come together. We must be realistic about the challenges posed by today's more complex trade landscape. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of the fact that avoiding catastrophic climate change is not a challenge that can be met by any one country or bloc acting alone. A trade and climate strategy geared at trade decoupling, fragmentation, and negative some technological competition cannot succeed. It is bound to fail and leave us all worse off. The report highlights that the WTO has a good foundation to help governments pursue different forms of cooperation on trade and climate, from transparency requirements, dialogue and peer review, to negotiations in several formats. I am encouraged that WTO members are using these instruments more and more. For example, we see an increase in the number of climate measures notified to the WTO. We see lively discussions in several WTO committees and groupings on border carbon adjustments and other trade-related climate measures. And we see concrete outcomes, such as the agreement on fishery subsidies reached at our 12th ministerial conference last June, the first time a WTO agreement puts environmental sustainability at its core. But if WTO members wanna make a real difference and harness the full potential of trade to drive the transition to a low carbon and more inclusive global economy, they must step up with additional action. I trust that this year's World Trade Report will provide them with the analytical underpinnings to chart a collective way forward that it is both ambitious and leaves no one behind. So with that, let's get started. I will now turn over to Ankai, Jose Antonio and Reiner for their presentation. And we will then hear from a panel of very distinguished speakers whom I will introduce in a moment. I see that we have a large audience from around the world and thank you very much for joining us. Please do post your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom and we will respond towards the end of the session. So colleagues, the floor is yours. Thank you, 
So as, as, an, as Annabel mentioned, uh, the World Trade Report 2022 looks at the complex relationship between climate change and international trade, including trade policy, climate policy, and international trade cooperation. The structure of the report is uh, as follows. Uh, chapter B discusses how climate change affects uh, international trade and how trade and trade policy can help to adapt to the consequences of climate change, commonly known as climate change adaptation. Chapter C discusses how achieving a low carbon economy will impact uh, trade patterns and provide new economic opportunities. While well, chapter uh, D discusses the role of uh, carbon pricing and the relationship between carbon pricing, trade policy, and trade. Chapter E discusses how trade contributes to uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions and how to decarbonize international trade, including international uh, transport. And finally, chapter F discusses the role of uh, trade in environmental goods and services uh, to uh, facilitate the development uh, and access and deployment of environmental technologies, which are essential uh, for climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. As mentioned by Annabel, the World Trade Report is a collective effort, and I take this opportunity to thank the other uh, lead authors of the, this report. Some of uh, are here present in the room. Mark Bacchetta, Eddie Beckers, Cosimo Beverelli, Matteo Ferrero, Emmanuel Gann, John Hancock, Rainer Lance, Roberta Piermartini, Daniel Ramos, and Anka Ishu. I also thank the other authors uh, of the report and those who provided written contribution. Thanks also to all those who helped with the production of the report, in particular, Ellen Swain for patience. Uh, the report also benefited from uh, external uh, experts from academia, think tank, and uh, international organizations who share, they share their views on specific trade-related climate change issues, and we are very much grateful for their uh, external contribution. Overall, uh, the World Trade Report 2022 addresses three main questions. The first asks how climate change can affect trade and how trade and trade policy can uh, support um, climate change adaptation efforts. The second question asks how much trade contributes to climate change and greenhouse gas emission, and what is the role of trade and trade policy in reducing also greenhouse gas emissions? And finally, the third question asks what is the role of international cooperation, and in particular, uh, international trade uh, cooperation in tackling climate change. Um, Ankai, uh, who is online, and Reiner here will uh, address the second and third question. I will, uh, for the time being, uh, address the first question about trade and uh, climate change adaptation. And the report basically shows that climate change is likely to change what we trade, who we trade with, and how we trade. But at the same time, international trade and trade policy can also help uh, countries uh, to adapt to the consequences of climate change. And so the report, uh, the report notes that economies are increasingly uh, exposed to a broad range of climate, climate crises and climate shocks, as discussed uh, and mentioned by, uh, by Anna Mel a moment ago. We saw uh, our recent floods in Pakistan left a third of the country uh, underwater, putting its food and economic security at risk. In other parts of the world, uh, the low level uh, of waters in many rivers uh, are making it impossible for ships to operate and uh, putting and disrupting supply chains uh, as a consequence. And so if climate change is left unchecked, changes in means, in particular higher temperatures, and sea level rise, and changes in extremes uh, with uh, more frequent and uh, intense uh, extreme weather event will um, lead to productivity losses, uh, supply shortages, uh, damage infrastructure, and ultimately also impact trade costs and transportation costs. 
The report notes that some sectors, in particular agriculture, uh, tourism, and a couple of manufacturing sectors are particularly um, vulnerable to climate impact. And developing countries, uh, in particular um, small island developing states and least developed countries, are also very vulnerable to the consequences of uh, climate change, even though they contributed the least to, to greenhouse gas emissions. And so in the long term, the report also notes that climate change could alter um, comparative advantages. And so reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, is essential to limit the consequences of climate change. But we know that past emissions have caused and continue to cause uh, global temperatures to rise, sea level to rise, and have increased the number of uh, extreme weather events. And some of the consequences of climate change uh, are likely to be uh, irreversible. And so adapting to climate change is a, develop a sustainable development imperative. And uh, there are different uh, ways to, um, to adapt to the consequences of climate change. Uh, typically, uh, the objective is to limit and to reduce the negative impact of the consequences of climate change while taking advantage of potential new um, economic opportunities that climate change might create. And this can be done by adapting our behaviors, so firms, uh, consumers, and governments, and also by modifying um, infrastructure. And so um, reducing the consequences of climate change can be achieved by identifying by preventing and minimizing, reducing climate risks, um, vulnerabilities, and exposures. And also by being prepared to cope with the effects of climate change and minimizing uh, the unavoidable losses and damages caused by climate change. So common examples of um, climate adaptation strategies include early warning systems, insurance, uh, introduction of new crops, uh, soil and water uh, conservation. And so, although the report stresses that uh, adapting to climate change will remain highly costly and disruptive, trade, uh, international trade can play an important role in uh, adapting to, to the consequences of climate change. And the report notes, for instance, that countries with more diversified exports tend to be uh, generally less vulnerable to the climate change, to the consequences of climate change, as you can see on, on, in the figure on the left. And also countries um, with a greater capacity to adapt to climate change tend to be countries with uh, greater openness to, to trade, uh, as you can see on, on, on the right. And in particular, the report uh, highlights the role of trade uh, in the different stages of uh, climate change adaptation strategies. And so first, uh, international trade can help and, and trade policies can help to prepare for climate shocks by supporting the development of climate resilient um, technologies. Trade can also support climate change adaptation strategies uh, indirectly through economic growth and uh, additional financial resources that can be used, allocated to finance uh, climate resilient uh, infrastructure. Uh, second, International trade can also help to cope with climate shocks by providing access to essential uh, goods and services such as food, um, uh, medical supplies, and uh, telecommunication. In the long, uh, long run, in the long term, trade can also contribute to uh, address part of um, food security by allowing regions uh, we used to rely on domestic agricultural production to import from um, food from regions less affected. And finally, allowing trade to resume faster after a climate shock can also support economic recovery and build more resilient uh, infrastructure. And Kai will now uh, address the second question uh, on trade and climate change mitigation. Thank you very much, Jose, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will walk you through the part of the report that deals with the role of trade in the transition to a low-carbon economy. 
If I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. The report examines the role of trade in greenhouse gas emissions, which cause climate change. The impact of trade on greenhouse gas emissions is complex, both positive, positive and negative. On the positive side, international trade increases the worldwide diffusion of lower emission goods, services, and know-how. Trade helps to drive down the costs of renewable energy through efficiency improvements, learning by doing, and economies of scale. Higher income uh, countries, higher income associated with trade also gives rise to greater demand for a clean environment. Trade opening also tends to shift resources to more productive producers, which also tend to have lower carbon intensity per unit of output. Through these mechanisms, trade can help reduce carbon emissions. And this figure shows the drastic cost decline of renewable energies over the past decade. The cost of solar power plummeted by almost 90% in 10 years, while the efficiency of solar panels has doubled since the 1980s. The cost of electricity from onshore wind also dropped by almost 70% in the past decade. A significant part of the cost decline has been attributed to global value chains, which enables producers to improve efficiency and reap economies of scale. Now, going back um, on the negative side, however, trade opening can also raise greenhouse gas emissions by increased production and transportation of products. It can also lead to changes in the composition of specialization, which can increase or reduce greenhouse gas emissions depending on whether the country has a comparative advantage in carbon intensive industries or processes. The amount of carbon emissions that are embedded in the production and the transportation associated with international trade accounted for about 30% of total emissions in 2018. And this figure shows that carbon emissions embedded in trade has been declining since 2011. Never mind. Um, and the decline is sharper than the decline of trade to GDP ratio after the financial crisis. Um, however, this does not mean that if countries close borders for trade, 30% of carbon emissions would have been saved. In the hopefully hypothetical situation where countries revert to autarky, or in other words, if they close borders for trade, domestic carbon productions would have to rise in order to meet the demand for consumption. This also means that countries are foregoing the large benefits from international trade. Now going to the next slide, because of the potentially positive role of international trade on carbon mitigation, trade and trade policies have been integral to countries' nationally determined contributions. That is the roadmap for carbon mitigation. Climate mitigation policies are multifaceted they aim to address the market failures in uh, tackling climate change. And they can include policy instruments such as command and control measures, market-based instruments such as carbon pricing, information instruments, and the voluntary agreements. Some of the measures may have trade implications, therefore highlighting the need for policy coordination. This figure shows the climate-related trade measures notified to the WTO. Between 2009 and 2020, WTO members notified close to 3,500 trade-related climate mitigation measures. They explicitly address climate change, energy conservation, efficiency, renewable and alternative energy. Support measures and technical regulations are the most common types of measures notified to the WTO. Finally, the report features WTO simulation looking at the impact of removing trade barriers in a set of energy-related environmental goods, including solar panels, wind, turbine, and wind turbines, and hydrogen. Eliminating tariffs and reducing non-tariff barriers in these goods can bring both trade and environmental benefits. It increases global exports in these products by 5%, corresponding to 109 billion US dollars. It could also help raise GDP for all the countries, at the same time, reducing trade barriers in these environmental goods could reduce net carbon emissions by 0.6% by 2030. 
This result captures two mechanisms, improvements in energy efficiency and the uptake of renewable energy, while the knock-on effects of innovation could potentially add more benefits to carbon mitigation. With this, let me pass the floor to Rainer, um, who will who talk about international cooperation in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Anke. The main message of the World Trade Report on international cooperation is that there's a greater need for international cooperation to make climate actions more effective and the low carbon transition more just and inclusive. Cooperation is, is required because climate change is a problem of the global commons, where the, where the emitters of global greenhouse gas emissions don't directly feel the, the impact or the cost of these emissions. Also, we see that the climate ambitions vary widely among countries. So this creates a risk that unilateral and uncoordinated trade policy, uh, trade-related climate measures stoke trade tensions, create uncertainty and discourage low carbon investment and impose a disproportionate cost on developing countries. So international trade cooperation can minimize trade tensions and support a stable environment for investment and deployment of low carbon and climate resilient technologies. Each, each thematic chapter of the, of the World Trade Report covers a section on international trade cooperation, outlining broader cooperation efforts such as under the UNCCC and also highlights efforts in regional trade agreements. For the purpose of this presentation, we focus on the role of WTO in international trade cooperation. An open and predictable uh, multilateral trading system facilitates <coughs> trade in environmental goods and services, which facilitate access to technologies needed for mitigation and adaptation action. It also helps with access to food and other critical supplies in case of climate shocks and helps thereby to build the resilience of countries against extreme weather events. WTO rules and uh, disciplines on uh, a number of trade-related climate measures help to prevent protectionism and promote efficient and effective trade-related climate policies. Members can take actions on climate change, but here the key is that the climate objective is at the center of the measure rather than the protection of domestic producers. Another important role of WTO is uh, transparency and dialogue. WTO has a number of transparency instruments, such as notifications, the trade policy review mechanism, and also the environmental database, which create transparency and thereby inform dialogue in committees and other WTO bodies, which can then lead to coherent and fit for purpose climate change policies. A fourth role is trade related technical assistance and the aid for trade initiatives, which helps countries that are most affected by, by climate change to build climate resilient trade capacity and infrastructure. Here you can see aid for trade disbursements related to climate change between 2013 and 2020, close to 100 US billion dollars have been dispersed on projects related to climate change. Uh, more, more aid for trade went to climate mitigation. And when we look at it, um, the majority of aid for trade targeted to climate adaptation uh, went to the agricultural sector, which highlights the vulnerability of this sector to climate change, while the around two thirds of uh, aid for trade to climate mitigation went to the energy and the transport sectors. The report also points to a number of areas where more uh, can be done. Seeing the proliferation of trade related climate measures, uh, such as uh, carbon pricing and decarbonization standards, the report points to the need to strengthen the ro role of WTO as a forum for coordination and dialogue and for then identifying potential action on trade and climate change. Here, the working regular committees, such as the uh, Committee on Trade and Environment, the Technical Bodies of Trade Committee, the, the TRIPS Council, the, the, uh, the Goods Council are important, but also members are pursuing these issues in new environmental initiatives, such as the trade and environmental sustainability structures discussions, 
the informal dialogue on plastics pollution and sustainable plastics trade, and the initiative on fossil fuel subsidy reform. <clears throat> For instance, climate change is, a, is a, main, a main theme in the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions, where members have dedicated discussions on trade-related climate measures and also have established working groups on environmental goods and services, uh, subsidies, and circular economy. Another area where more can be done is that the report highlights that trade should be an integral part in the solution against climate change, so members can do more to integrate and use trade policies in their nationally determined contributions on national adaptation plans. Also, more can be done to enhance the resilience of supply chains. For instance, by deepening and diversifying supply and transport networks, uh, members countries can build resilience against climate shocks and by, by improving information sharing and monitoring, uh, it is possible to increase, increase food and energy security and also to identify and better manage supply chain bottlenecks. There's also scope to improve the synergies between climate finance and aid for trade. By mainstreaming or better integrating climate consideration into, into trade strategies and trade consideration into, into climate, uh, climate strategies, uh, development cooperation can be made more effective. It helps to identify investment opportunities and to mobilize more funding, uh, including from the private sector. Finally, the report also uh, highlights the need to strengthen cooperation between the WTO and other international organizations. For instance, better quality data is required on environmental goods and services. And here, for instance, WTO could strengthen its cooperation with the World Customs Organization. So this brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, Ankai, and uh, Reiner for your clear and uh, comprehensive presentations. And congratulations again on an excellent uh, report. Let me now introduce our three distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we are very lucky uh, to have with us today three thought leaders on climate, economics, and policy issues. Professor Brian uh, Copeland, who is professor at the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British uh, Columbia. Professor Copeland's research focuses on environmental economics and international trade, and he has authored several influential studies in this area. Dr. Mikala Krishnan, who is a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute, her research focuses on various topics related to inclusive growth and economic development. Her most recent research focuses on the near-term impact of physical climate risk across sectors and geographies, including its implications for companies and countries. And Mrs. Elizabeth Press, who is Director of Planning and Programming Support at IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, an organization that supports countries worldwide in their transition to a sustainable energy future. I am pleased to note that our institutions have cooperated very successfully in the past including in the preparation of a joint publication last year on trade, solar, solar energy, and quality. Let me also welcome uh, DDG Jean-Marie uh, Pogam, uh, who is with us here on stage. So, um, Professor Copeland, uh, you have written extensively on the interlinkage between globalization and climate change. In what way do trade and globalization affect the response to climate change? And what are the emerging issues uh, in this area? Over to you, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess I'd just start by uh, joining the Deputy Director General and congratulating the authors on the report. It's, it's a really nice report, uh, very well written, very informative, and be very useful. Um, I think the report does a really good job in um, uh, sort of outlining the ways in which trade can also can be very helpful in uh, dealing with uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation to climate change and also uh, in uh, talking about some of the ways that trade can create challenges um, in in terms of the positive role in adaptation and mitigation you know through diffusion of new technologies and providing large markets to create incentives to innovate and uh, uh, 
allowing adaptation, uh, you know, in response to changes in productivity shocks and things like that. Um, there, there's, you know, trade is, is, is I think, clearly um, crucial in, in helping the world um, deal with issues like this. I mean, there, there will be some tensions. I think part of it arises from, if you look at kind of the history of the WTO and the GATT, you started with a world with a lot of regulations, the trade barriers and so on. And part of the agenda was kind of, if you like, deregulating, moving to a world, moving closer to a market outcome, having rules against subsidies and things like that. Um, the, the freer market outcome was looked at as desirable. Here we have a case where the market outcome is not good. You know, there's too much pollution and the pace of innovation is too slow uh, for, you know, in, in green energy. And so what we're seeing is, of course, um, a lot of government intervention. Not all governments want to use carbon pricing. And to speed up innovation, there'll be a lot of subsidies. Um, and so I think there'll be some tensions when governments are handing out subsidies. They want them to go to local producers, not foreigners. So there's issues of local content. You hear a lot of talk about industrial policies. There's you know new industries emerging. Um, and so that I think can lead some, to some trade tensions. But underlying all of that, you know, trade is playing a useful and crucial role. Um, if, if you look at some of the ways in which trade is potentially uh, creating some challenges in dealing with climate change, I mean, I guess I'll just mention a couple of them. One of them is um, just the, the way in which trade itself generates carbon emissions, uh, especially through international transport. And I guess here, one way to look at it is just that there's trade-offs. I mean, uh, transport generates carbon emissions, but also it generates a lot of benefits. For example, if you export solar panels, that's going to uh, lead to uh, reductions in carbon emissions. And part of the cost of that might be some carbon emissions generated during the trade. Um, but of course, at the same time, um, uh, the emissions generated during transport can be reduced. And here, I think, you know, there's it's, there's interesting challenges, if you like, because a lot of the emissions take place in international airspace or on the high seas. Um, and uh, and so the coming up with ways to uh, cooperate and regulate uh, emissions in international transports is uh, both challenging and interesting. And, you know, you see there's some things happening now. Um, the, the other issue is, um, um, I guess, given the reality that countries are unlikely to take a coordinated approach to um, to uh, carbon pricing uh, and regulation, uh, we're going to see a lot of differences in the stringency of regulation across countries. And this has the potential to create leakage. And I, I think leakage is something that you know we need to worry about. Um, so to date, the and I think the report report points this out that the evidence on actual carbon leakage is that it doesn't seem to have been very big uh, so far. But I think there's a few reasons to worry about that, that it, it's probably going to get worse. And one is that the data um, comes from a time when carbon prices weren't really that high. The second is governments have been worried about leakage. And so there's been um, uh, efforts to shelter trade exposed sectors in order to uh, reduce possible leakage, either through um, free allowances or exemptions and things like that. Um, and then the other issue is that um, there's a lot of evidence now about the on the effects of um, um, the stringency of environmental regulation in other contexts, particularly in regulating low, local air pollution. So the, the effects of those kinds of regulations on trade competitiveness. And I think the, the evidence is fairly clear now that uh, these sorts of regulations do reduce international competitiveness um, and so create some trade challenges. And I think in, in the context of things like air pollution, governments have been willing to put up with this to uh, partly because it's just part of the cost of getting cleaner air. Uh, the benefits of uh, improving air quality are immediate and obvious to uh, people. Uh, lots of health benefits, um, and the air just looks cleaner. Um, and so, although uh, the competitive issue has has kind of always been there, it's 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 as I say, it's it's, it's just part of the cost of of having cleaner air. And to some extent, in some cases, governments might be happy to see some really seriously polluting industries move away. Um, in the context of of uh, carbon emissions, um, uh, the benefits are. Um, longer term and a much more diffuse. You reduce carbon emissions in your country, the benefits are global, not just local. Uh, and they're also not immediately obvious. Um, and so 
I think the combination of the need for uh, really aggressive carbon policy and the large differences across countries in the stringency regulation will mean that there is strong pressure to do something about leakage. And so things like border carbon taxes, um, I think, are going to be uh, uh, an issue. Um, and um, and we're probably going to, you know, that, that will be necessary. And I think not just as a mechanism to target emissions. And one of the issues of leakage is you worry you reduce your emissions, they go up somewhere else. And border carbon tax might reduce that channel through which emissions would increase. I think that's important, but I think the, and you can sort of debate about how big that effect is, but I think a major issue is just the political viability of aggressive part of carbon policy. Um, I think the concerns about leakage um, will make it more difficult politically to see aggressive carbon regulation. Um, so I think there's, there's a, potential role for the WTO here in, in the sense that uh, when you're talking about border carbon adjustments, um, you are talking about, you know, import barriers. And so there's a this sort of tension between the temptation to use them as trade protection and uh, perhaps the need to use them to support your carbon policy. And so ideally some sort of rules-based system and uh, or at least some sort of cooperation and thinking about how to implement border measures, uh, measures uh, would be uh, desirable. Um, and so as I say, I think potentially that's one of the ways in which, in, in addition to all the other ways that have been talked about, that the WTO can play a useful role here in helping uh, the transition towards uh, a lower carbon emission world. I guess that's all I'll say for now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Copeland. Uh, Dr. Krishnan, let me now turn over to you. Uh, your work focuses uh, the private sector's role in mitigating climate change and adapting uh, to its consequences. How would rising climate risks impact the organization of global supply chains? And what are companies doing to mitigate these uh, risks? Over to you, please. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and i um, really excited to be here to um, both hear the presentation and, and be a part of the launch of this, this great report, as, as Professor Copeland said and other speakers have said as well. I think this is a, a really vital contribution at this stage of the debate. Um, I think uh, it's especially timely that it's come during COP and um, is bringing together the intersection of two very important issues in the, in the world today, trade and, and climate change. So a really timely and um, I, in particular, appreciate the very nuanced way in which the report handled this intersection, right? There, there, is, uh, there are both challenges as well as opportunities, and the report did a very thorough job, I think, in outlining both the challenges and, and opportunities and the role an institution like the WTO can play given those challenges and opportunities. Um, so what I want to do is just give some quick um, remarks um, around, around that intersection of, of trade and, and climate change, as well as decarbonization. And I want to do that drawing on some of the research that we at the McKinsey Global Institute have been doing over the last few years on physical risks and the net zero transition. I will also be drawing a little bit on um, forthcoming research that we will be releasing actually on the, on the 16th, that is looking at the changing nature of globalization and the forces that are reshaping globalization today. So some of the remarks that I will give related to concentration of, of trade in particular will, will draw from some of that forthcoming research. We will launch a discussion paper on the 16th and then a, a, a bigger report early next year uh, that covers some of these issues. So let's try and um, first understand, uh, you know, Professor Copeland talked about how climate change, uh, how, the, the role that trade can play in addressing climate related issues. I want to address it from the other vantage point, which is how climate related issues affect trade. Um, and there's really two ways that this happens. The first um, is really around physical climate risks and the role that physical climate risks can play in influencing trade. The second is as we undertake actions to address climate change, so undertake the net zero transition, that in turn could have an effect on trade and the, the organization of supply chains. So let's talk a little bit about both of these. Um, if I look at the first point, how physical risks in turn affect trade, um, there is, of course, in, in a warming world, the, the Earth has warmed about 1.1 degrees Celsius relative to, to pre-industrial times. We expect to see, um, we, we already see and expect to, to see increasing risks, both the frequency and severity of acute events, as well as increasing severity of chronic events. 
Now, as these various events have unfolded and risks are expected to rise, that can affect supply chains in numerous ways, many of which were highlighted in, in the report. The first is around just the viability of different areas for production. And this is particularly important when we think about things like agriculture, our ability to produce, for example, certain crops in certain parts of the world could be profoundly affected. So there is a, a changing viability of certain locations. The second is, of course, reducing productivity. So, for example, as rising heat um, occurs in different parts of the world, that could affect labor productivity and affect labor intensive manufacturing. The third is around disruptions that are caused as a result of acute events, things like flooding or increased sev increasingly severe hurricanes. And that in turn could create disruptions in production activity and supply shortages. And then finally, transportation itself um, being affected as a result of, of climate change. So, for example, drought affecting um, level of water, water levels in, in rivers or canals and that affecting trade costs. So, so it is really a holistic set of, of ways that trade is affected as a result of rising physical risks, everything from viability of production to productivity to disruptions and, and transportation. And now, as all of this is manifested in supply chains, there are different effects that different types of supply chains could experience. Um, as one example, if we think about a highly specialized supply chain, the more severe an up upstream impact is, um, the more severe the, the impact on a downstream player could be as a result of shortages of a critical input. So in specifically specialized supply chains, upstream damages could have profound implications on downstream suppliers. On the other hand, if we think about a very commoditized supply chain, um, it's not just one downstream player that could be affected, but multiple numbers of downstream players that could be affected as a result, for example, of spiking uh, prices that result from shortages in supply. So it's both a very, very broad set of impacts that supply chains could experience and then different types of impacts that downstream players could, could see as a result of these upstream implications. I'll just give you one example of the magnitude of impacts that our research has sized we considered um, a high emission scenario, so what climate scientists call an RCP 8.5 scenario, um, and looked at the implication of this high emission scenario absent any adaptation in 2030 and 2050 on food production. Um, so as the report also highlights, you know, production of the world's major grains, things like rice, corn, wheat, and soy, happen in specific bread baskets around the world. It's highly concentrated in about five or six different bread baskets. And so we looked at the likelihood of a multiple breadbasket failure, multiple of these breadbaskets around the world simultaneously failing as a result of rising risks. Um, and we defined this failure as a global harvest failure of more than 15% relative to averages. And so what we find is that the likelihood of this magnitude of breadbasket failure could double between today and 2030, quadruple between today and 2050 in this high emission scenario. So these are substantial risks that are already, in some sense, baked into the system that we need to find ways to adapt to. So what all of this says is that there's a profound implication of trade on uh, uh, as a result of rising physical risk. Now, there is a risk to look at all of this and say that the challenge is that trade is highly concentrated and that concentration is creating risk in, in trade. And therefore, the response should be retrenching from trade, retreating from trade. But our research would suggest that that's widely not the right response to consider. Um, and that concentration in and of itself is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. And it's in fact a two-sided coin. Uh, concentration in some sense reflects specialization. It, it reflects efficiency gains. It reflects competitive advantage. And what we find is that no region in the world is close to being self-sufficient. Um, every region we looked at key types of resources or manufacturing, manufactured goods that countries rely on and every region imports more than 25% of at least one type of important resource or manufactured good. So retrenching from trade, retrenching from the nature of supply chains today is, is indeed not desirable and in fact not even viable, uh, and in fact re represents efficiency gains and competitive advantage in the system. So what all of this means is that we need to take a new look at trade to respond to these physical risks. Um, so that's kind of point number one. Point number two that I'd, I'd quickly make, and I know other speakers will get at this as well, is the fact that the, the net zero transition in and of itself could reshape trade in a variety of ways. There are an entire set of new opportunities that are created, um, everything from the inputs we need to create renewable energy to a whole range of services, for example, financial services or, or uh, carbon accounting services that are needed to support this net zero transition and a whole plethora of trade flows in goods and services can be created 
um, to, to uh, better support these opportunities and indeed create a whole set of opportunities for countries to participate in a new way in trade. So as we undertake the transition, both climate change as well as the net zero transition have a profound implication on trade. As we think about how companies are responding to this, uh, I would say they're in very early stages of their journey, both in addressing the risks that are created by climate change, as well as the net zero transition, much more work to be done, but they're really thinking about it in three different ways. The first is thinking about their own organizations and how to build risk, a bit resiliency to risks in their own organization, how to reorganize their own um, business operations to decarbonize, as well as capture some of the opportunities that arise from a net zero transition. That is where I'd say the bulk of attention of companies has focused to date. Uh, oftentimes, this has taken the form of building the muscle to both understand risks and capture opportunities, uh, building greater transparency and data awareness of where they have risks in their supply chains. One thing that COVID revealed was that companies had visibility into their tier one suppliers, but not so much their tier two and tier three suppliers. Um, and so companies are investing a lot in building that data transparency as well as a whole set of digital tools to understand their exposure to risk. So that's where a lot of the corporate attention is focused. I think the second um, area that corporate attention is starting to focus is around not just their own operations and their own organizations, but the supply chain, their supply chains more broadly. And this is where I think companies are realizing that rather than a retrenchment from trade or retreat from trade, it is investing in resiliency in their supply chains that is the, the pathway to, to better understand and manage these risks. So companies are thinking about things like diversifying their supply chains, like partnering with their suppliers to build additional resiliency, um, investing in adaptation in their key supply chain locations. So a whole range of ways in which they are engaging with trade rather than retreating from trade. And then thirdly, companies are also starting to engage in the ecosystem more broadly what they can do um, in partnership with other organizations, what they can do with the public sector, uh, what they can do in, in terms of engaging with institutions like the WTO. Um, and as Professor Copeland says, the, the nature of this climate challenge will require collaboration, it will require coordination, and um, private and public sector partnership will be crucial in, in driving that. The last thing I will just say is that one of the, the phrases in the report that really stuck with me was the phrase force multiplier. And I think it's important when we think about this intersection of trade and, and climate that we don't think about trade as a panacea to address every climate issue, which I think indeed the, the report also highlights, um, and that there is a whole range of other policies that are needed to drive the sustainability agenda forward. But trade can be an important force multiplier in, in driving action. And it's important, I think, in this moment to almost think about a new reimagined um, re, re, renewed um, aspiration for trade in supporting the sustainability agenda. So I'll, I'll stop there and happy to address more questions in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Krishnan, for, for your interesting remarks. Let me now turn uh, to Ms. Uh, Press. Um, Ms. Press, Irena is at the forefront of efforts uh, to support countries to adopting low carbon technologies. The transition to a low carbon global economy will create uh, enormous opportunities for developed and developing countries alike, as we just heard, but it also requires significant investment in renewable power generation. What is the role of uh, innovation and technology in the low carbon transition? And what are the challenges for developing countries to adopt low carbon technologies? Over to you, please. Thank you very much. And let me apologize at the outset. I'm actually in Egypt at a, at a climate conference and uh, I, the only quiet place I could find is actually very close to the road. So you probably hear quite a lot of uh, background noise. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, um, I, I want to convey a little bit of a sentiment of what, uh, uh, what is it like in Sharm el Sheikh at the moment. Um, I have been following COP for quite a few years. And what I find very interesting this year is that we are having a lot of, of this uh, cross-sectoral discussions, so including the, the, the launch of your report, uh, which is really interesting. And I want to congratulate the colleagues for the the comments, previous comments. It really an, it is an interesting and nuanced report that adds a lot to the debate. And, uh, and it is very encouraging to see how many of the conversations that we are having this year are going a little bit further rather than just a clear mitigation adaptation conversation that they traditionally have had at COP. 
Um, so let me let me zoom in on the question that you are posing, and uh, and obviously I'm coming from the energy sector that permeates throughout the economy, and uh, and and touches upon so many aspects uh, of uh, of the climate effort. Um, and in some ways, it, it, the, the the movement that we see towards zero is very much enabled by uh, by the innovation and technology because the progress in renewables gave the courage to many to make bold commitments and uh, and uh, and to 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 launch into the net zero thinking because of the solutions that came through um, a few decades of innovation around especially solar and wind uh, that uh, made it cost effective and just recently in Saudi Arabia we came down to one cent per kilowatt of our power power generation so that which is really uh, I mean, below and anything that we know uh, today. So, so, so we have a cost-effective technology solution. And uh, so, what we see is that until now, uh, for the last five, six years, uh, renewables have been a majority of new power additions. So, last year it was about 270 gigawatts added to a global system, and of that, 80% uh, was renewable. But uh, to your question of developing countries, when you look where these technologies are deployed, they're largely deployed in the in the global north, and together with China and India, they, they are obviously the the, the two lead, leaders in the global south. But we see really geographical limitations uh, in where these technologies are deployed. And uh, earlier this year, uh, Arena launched this report on Africa uh, on the market analysis of Africa and. Uh, it was really, I mean, personally, I was really taken aback. Uh, in two decades, about three trillion uh, were invested in renewables globally. And of that, only 60 billion uh, in Africa, where we know there is the greatest need in terms of uh, uh, gaps in access and, uh, and, and the development, uh, uh, sustainable development. So, so there really is a fundamental issue in uh, uh, how the technologies are um, uh, diffused, in, distributed, diffused in, in, in the global south. And the, 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 few, the few issues around it, one is an obvious one around finance, there is very limited finance and there is, uh, it, it's, it's very much linked to, um, you know, the frameworks, regulatory frameworks and, uh, and the high risks, estimated risks, uh, so, the, so the challenge for the private sector to, um, uh, to go into, into some of these areas. The second part is, uh, um, the, the, the business model is still, uh, it's very different. We are looking at a decentralized raise of 10 profits. So the, 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 the profitability of these projects uh, is also um, at times not attracting the scale that is necessary. And what we see a little bit of change with the, uh, with the focus on hydrogen, because obviously this is, this is a bit of a larger scale. So, so there, is a more, there is more promise around that. Um, and uh, and uh, um, there is always a, uh, a, a complaint around the project pipelines and uh, and and whether whether we can um, have the the, the, the the bankability of these projects to, to come come online. And the combined this uh, this uh, th these are um, uh, not very difficult issues to overcome, but they require a different type of cooperation. They require a different type of thinking. And we still haven't haven't realized that we are not replacing fuels. We are changing the system. And uh, uh, so, just to give you a few numbers, for instance, in uh, uh, in today's uh, um, energy system, uh, about eighty percent of people live in countries that are net energy importers. And with renewable system, almost every country has at least some uh, potential to harness uh, to be self sufficient. So there is a huge shift in the way that some of these things can and will evolve. So we estimated in 2050 that the, the cross-border trade of energy commodities will remain about the same in, in, in terms of volume, but the mix will be fundamentally different because, uh, because most of it will be around new technologies and new ways of trade. For instance, we estimate the hydrogen, uh, the cross-border trade of hydrogen will, uh, will go up to some 20% in 2050, uh, which this point then is a minute. Um, so there is all these different shifts and changes, and uh, and uh, and we have a huge opportunity to have a more equal uh, um, and more inclusive global economy as we and to use the energy transition as an enabler. Um, so uh, for one, we cannot limit the the uh, the conversation around the development and deployment of technology. 
it has to happen and we also need to recognize that the technologies that are suitable for the global north they're not necessarily suitable for global south so there has to be a lot more investment in innovation in the global south to find solutions that fit them i mean for instance um you know that the, the the productive the productive use uh, of, of the centralized renewables it's a huge market and uh, uh, but the innovation is still very ad hoc and limited so there has to be a concerted effort to support the innovation incubate incubators and entrepreneurs in the global south to be able to innovate for their own conditions and that this is starting to happen but it's not very common and uh, and uh, that we also need to remember that some of these innovations, as the central system takes hold, will also be very useful globally. I mean, we have seen it in telephony as a pair, as you go, and other, and other innovations that came from the global south that made a difference in the global north as well. As well. Then the second thing, the, the, the new value chains emerging in, in energy, uh, some of it, um, some of these are linked to um, uh, raw materials and I think uh, one of the previous panelists uh, mentioned this is a very high high priority at this point in time and we also need to make sure that that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past uh, when extractive industry um, uh, both in terms of the, the environmental and social impact but also the value uh, the value that uh, uh, that, 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 that was gained in local communities so uh, some of these conversations will have to happen up front. Uh, we had some of them here with uh, with uh, uh, with, the, with a few countries there at the forefront of uh, uh, of raw material um, uh, production and export, and uh, so so we really need to be uh, we have the opportunity to shape some of these things more proactively because we need we need larger volumes and we need uh, a new uh, uh, we need to diversify current supply chains and there is an opportunity to have a greater socioeconomic. Uh, um, uh, footprint uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 the, uh, in different countries and the the fine the final uh, point that i would like to make at this point is is, is around the uh, the integration of um, of uh, uh, structural institutions we, we cannot have the same conversation uh, in the, in the same silos of the economy of the 20th century the, the economy in 21st century will look different in 2050 and the energy is a huge part of it, both as a driver and as a, as a consequence. And uh, and we need to we need to rethink the structures in which we operate today and break the silos so that we can proactively shape uh, some of the solutions. And your report actually addresses some of this, but but it is very important to continue having this conversation across sectors and across communities to make sure that we uh, come to a cleaner and more inclusive world in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Press, for your remarks. Um, and now I would like to open it up here uh, in uh, in the room or online uh, for your questions uh, and uh, comments. Anyone here in the room, please? Okay, so let me now go online while you think about your questions. And we have a first question here. It basically says, uh, thank you so much for a very insightful and informative report and panel discussion. How the global healthcare and pharmaceutical trade is going to be impacted by climate change induced changing disease incidence and disease pattern in the existing and future times. Thank you very much, uh, Sampara Dash, for your question. Uh, and let me ask uh, Jose Antonio or uh, Ankai or Reiner if they would like to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, this is not an issue that we cover explicitly in, in the report, although we we, we mentioned that, uh, as uh, explaining the question, that uh, one of the consequences of climate change is changing, um, is the, the rise of new, uh, new diseases, um, not just uh, for humans, but also for uh, animal and plants. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, uh, as we saw it with the pandemic, trade can play a big role in addressing and providing access to uh, to the need necessary uh, drugs to to address uh, new diseases. I don't know if uh, Ankai wants to. Uh, yes. Add. 
Thank you very, very much for the question. Um, as Josie has alluded to, the report doesn't touch on uh, medications and public health per se, but it does um, say that uh, because of the increasing warming world and uh, humidity, there might be more incidences as well as the cross-border spread of uh, diseases. So that also underlines the need for um, innovation in pharmaceuticals as well as more trade in innovative um, pharmaceuticals in order to address the potential public health impacts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose and uh, Ankai. And uh, if we don't have any other uh, question here in the room or online, let me now then turn it over uh, to my colleague, uh, Deputy Director General Jean-Marie Porgam, for some concluding thoughts and closing remarks. Uh, and not before uh, thanking uh, all of our uh, panelists uh, for great comments and great uh, insights. So thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Jean-Marie. Thank you very much, uh, Annabelle. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks first of all to the authors of the of the report and the speakers who who commented it. Um, actually, I was very glad to see Madame Press from a talking from Trammell Czech and uh, our Director General. You know, successfully presented the report last week in in the COP twenty seven uh, conference, and its key message have been very welcomed, I believe, by the the participants. So. We are echoing that uh, today. The report's central message is that trade has been a critical missing piece of the puzzle to address climate change, and this for far too long. Uh, and our discussion today shows very clearly that the WTO is an integral part of the climate solution. There are three key points that I would like to, to propose as, as take away from uh, our, our, our very rich discussion. First, it has been mentioned by uh, Professor Copland in first, but also uh, Madam Krishnan, we will, not win, we will not win the fight against climate change at the expense of a fragmentation of the world trading system. And the WTO is precisely the place where we want to manage this risk. For instance, the report notes how carbon pricing policies are increasingly fragmented across countries. There are close to 70 different carbon pricing schemes already in place, and such fragmentation raises costs for companies complying with such policies and can even lead to trade tensions. To mitigate these risks, more coordination of carbon pricing policies and ambitious equivalent measures is required. Another example where more cooperation and harmonization is required is carbon standards. We are similarly facing a situation of fragmentation uh, due to a proliferation of initiatives, standards, definitions, and thresholds for heavy industry decarbonization. So fragmentation is equally a problem in this context, as too many inconsistent standards can be a source of confusion, uncertainty, and higher transaction costs for industries seeking to decarbonize. It can also lead to the emergence of trade tensions among trading partners and marginalized vulnerable countries. So no one should shy away from the increasing trade concerns raised by the topics in terms of carbon leakages, as they have been discussed, and fears of disguised protectionism. But the good news is that the WTO already offers a unique international trade forum for encouraging greater international alignment of carbon policies and address these tensions. For instance, we can use our traditional comparative advantages in this house on discussing border adjustments, clubs, and competitiveness concerns in the 21st century context. Also, our TBT agreement, Trade and Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, promotes transparency and harmonization in standards setting, enhancing alignment and comparability across standards needed to decarbonize heavy industries. We are ready here to foster discussions between WTO members and with other re relevant international organizations, including the IMF, the OECD, and others to advance discussions on the need to establish a shared understanding and a more harmonized approach to these topics. My second takeaway is that the international cooperation on trade can efficiently support the fight against climate change on both mitigation and adaptation fronts. I think it has been widely uh, covered during the discussion on the panel. Uh, 
I'll just be brief here. On mitigation, the objective is to reduce the contribution of trade to global carbon emissions. That means first to decarbonize trade itself, which has a lot to do with the climate impact of logistics in international trade, particularly transportation and energy. This issue is being tackled, for instance, for maritime transportation in the context of the International Maritime Organization. Also, to leverage trade uh, for decarbonizing trade-related economic activities, the report abundantly shows some, that some simple traditional trade policies, like import tariffs, can in many cases be skewed toward high carbon content goods and against low ones. So rebalancing trade policy in favor of pro-climate goods, technologies, and services is necessary. On adaptation, more than ever, this year has made clear that we face a climate urgency from the flooding in Pakistan to droughts in the Horn of Africa. Trade is absolutely vital to strengthen our resilience against such climate shocks by providing access to food, medicines, and other critical goods and services and by fostering uh, access to technologies and creating economic opportunities. This is a multiply, force multiplier that was um, alluded to by uh, Madam Krishnan. Trade plays an essential role in a just transition to a local carbon economy by fostering the development access, development access and affordability of climate technologies through increased uh, market size, competition and scale economies. And there was this very striking example that you mentioned, uh, Jose Antonio, in the report, uh, about 40% of the cost decline, uh, in, uh, the decline in the cost of solar panels in the last 30 years has been linked to scale economies in, uh, in, in trade. Or maybe it was you who mentioned it, I, or um, Anki. Um, third message and last message, we do have much room for improvement in the way international cooperation currently operates on trade and climate change. Uh, a lot of effort are still being needed to, uh, I quote uh, Madam Press, to break the silos. The recent report from the IPCC and the discussion at COP27 made it abundantly clear that we are in an all hands on deck situation. We must create synergies wherever we can. For instance, there are very few bridges existing between the Paris Agreement and the WTO. The Paris Agreement is based on bottom-up efforts from each country with its National Determined Contributions, or NDC. One key message from the report brought to COP27 is that we must integrate trade and trade policies into the NDCs and long-term low-carbon development plans going forward. And the WTO can bring a lot here because the work we do already provides important indications on what could be done. About 4,600 trade measures notified to the WTO since 2009 seek to contribute to climate actions. These are tariffs, taxes, and regulations. They also support measures such as, such as grants, financing mechanisms, and public procurement. So the question is how to leverage this momentum that we see through the notifications which uh, we receive uh, to get some concrete outcomes in terms of uh, leading the change. To conclude my remarks, the WTO, with our trade rules and our global membership, can and is ready to play its role and help trade deliver in the fight against climate change. Several of our members have started to tackle this question and want to accelerate the work on it. These are the initiatives that you have been alluded to, uh, Rainer. And we hope that the insight from the reports will help our members move the discussion forward. With that hope, I'm going to bring this event uh, to a close. I'd like to thank again and commend uh, the, our division, uh, our research division, our trade and environment division for their uh, very promising um, and fantastic report. Um, it was only possible with the contribution of other colleagues uh, in the house. So let us uh, all let, let's all be thanks uh, for that if there is nothing to add i'll just um, call it a day and thank you very much to everyone for your participation <laughs>